and we and we're live. Um, so th this is a presentation on Switch Dave in the Wild. Uh, Anton is going to share his the experiences they had in deploying Switch Dave, and anything else you want to add for as an intro, Anton. Uh, no, no, I think we could start with the presentation. Okay, I'm going to get started here. And you and I will disappear. Hello, my name is Anton Kortnov, and I'm a tech lead of a NogDev team in Yandex. Uh, our company is a search engine in Russia and we have a web search engine and a lot of services like taxi, music, movie streaming services, uh, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of services. Uh, and we are running all the services in our own cloud cluster scale operation system. So we are a hyperscale cloud operator. We run our software on the commodity hardware and all our resources are in that large pool that is operated uh, via our operational system. And we control our network, we control our network hosts, we control our network stack on that hosts, we control the software stack on that host. So we could do a lot of things. Uh, all that hosts are in uh, several large data centers in Russia and abroad. And each data center is up to 100,000 servers. And as I said, uh, we have control over everything. So we are able to create the IPv6 only fabric uh, with a top of rack switch that is uh, running in L3 mode and our network design uh, is a multi-stage clause. So basically, in a very simplified view, it looks like this. Uh, white boxes are top of rack switches, colored boxes are spine two and spine one uh, switches of our clause network. And um, we use IPv6 only and uh, this design is pretty common for cloud providers so the facebook use pretty same uh, topology uh, we use a bgp uh, on ipv6 link local addresses uh, so what other we need from our top of rack switches uh, qos uh, we need uh, acl filters and acl counters we need the telemetry and monitoring, of course, and we need uh, some kind of automation of config deployment to that switches. We already tried uh, several Linux-based network operational systems, and historically, the first one was a uh, Cumulus Linux. Uh, we used that for several years, and our automation tools works fine with it. Uh, it uh, runs good uh, and we want to move to the open source network operational systems. So we tried Sonic, but unfortunately it doesn't fit our requirements. For example, it doesn't work well with uh, IPv6 link local address as well. And last year, Mellanox uh, uh, offered us uh, switches with uh, switch dev. We tried that in our lab, it works fine. And this spring, we deployed a couple of hundreds of these switches in our data centers. So right now our data centers are powered by switch dev switches. First of all, I want to thank uh, Alexander Petrovsky. He helped us a lot. He uh, wrote basic scripts to build the image for all these switches. Uh, we use uh, Ubuntu Bionic as a base operational system. We use a uh, systemd as a init system. 
uh, we use Mellanox chassis management scripts um, that will do that job with a fans, LEDs, uh, thermal control, and that kind of stuff. Uh, as I said, we used Cumulus previously, so we are happy with the if up down too, and we reused that in uh, our switch dev operational system. And we use a VRF scripts from Alexander. So, baking image is not enough to run switch in our production system. We need to configure it. Uh, basically, when you are talking about the fleet of servers, you are prefer to use some kind of automation system like Ansible, Puppet, Sal, Chef, whatever. And basically, that configuration systems are inspired by the idea that we need to bring the state of the server to the desired state. But when we are talking about the closed source vendor boxes, it usually have some kind of um, commits of the configs on the device. So we could look through the history locally and we could roll back changes if it goes bad. And we want our uh, switch dev switches to act like uh, vendor closed source boxes. So we wrote the Linux commit P. It's based on the ATC keeper. And the idea is pretty simple. We use Git as a storage backend. We put a slash ATC folder uh, under Git control. And there is some hooks that resolves config to the service that should be restarted if we touch that configuration file and change anything inside that. And as it uses Git, it allows to roll back changes locally on this switch if something goes wrong. And it allows to look through the history and uh, find who changes and why something is changed. And there is a very strong requirement from this system. Uh, each service that is working under control of this system should be idempotent. It means if we change config and rerun that hooks, the service should uh, reload with that config nicely. I'll talk uh, a few issues with that later. Uh, for the authentication of our users, we use, again, something like uh, used on a vendor boxes. We use a, a TACAX server, uh, we use a TAC plus library, and we use a patches sudo with the patches from Gaia that came from Cumulus. And we use our own TACAX server uh, with a centralized access control. Uh, that could be reviewed and uh, audited by our uh, security guys. OK, we have configuration files. Uh, we have image. And we need to deploy somehow fresh boxes with that image and with that config. Uh, basically, the white box switches that I know came with the only loader. And it works pretty well. Uh, but as I said, we have IPv6 only fabric and we want to move to IPv6 only management network. And ONI doesn't work, unfortunately, well with the IPv6 management network. And another issue that we have with ONI is our flow of deploying hardware. First of all, all the devices are put inside the network, uh, connected with the cables, provided with the power. So each switch is already powered on. And after that, in a few days, we decided the role of each switch and what operational system should we use for that switch. And only at that point, we know what should be on that switch. And until that, uh, we don't know what to provide to ONI and only doesn't provide from every box uh, 
what box is it? It doesn't provide any serial number or any other identifier uh, from the box. And that's bad. That, that's a place that I hope some somehow would be fixed in the ONI. And after we get the image on uh, our box, we need to provide initial configuration. We need a zero touch provisioning. Uh, I tried to find any ZTP realization uh, for Linux, and I didn't found that. Uh, there is some uh, kind of uh, ZTP, but it's uh, targeted to uh, running images in the clouds. It doesn't uh, work with uh, the HTTP well. So we wrote our own scripts. Uh, they are based on the DH client. Uh, they run on a fresh box. And there is a very important part of that scripts. Uh, we need the way to observe how our deployment is going on. So we need to write the logs of the deployment. And we need a way to transfer that logs to our log servers. So we need to hard code, hard code that to our image uh, and use that to get some observability of the deployment process. And unfortunately, it is not very consistent with our current deployment infrastructure that is targeted to the vendor boxes. We use a console port to put the commands uh, to that boxes. So we don't use uh, DHCP for them. And this scheme uh, by itself is um, very good. It works well. But when we are talking with, about the only switches, there is a grab. And when that deployment system will type any button, for example, it will try to log in to the device and the crop menu will be on screen at that time, it will hang the boot process. So we need to be very careful with our current deployment infrastructure and separate the console ports of our white box switches from that infrastructure. How do we work with our switches with our configurations? First of all, we need to uh, configure low-level parts of the switch. For example, if we need to split the port, uh, 100G port to like 425G ports uh, with a dev link. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, it uh, allows us to put the port split configuration to set up traps and policers to get the counters from that traps uh, to get the counters about the resource usage. But it's pretty hard to use the devlink subsystem from the code. So if we have a library in Python, for example, how would we configure a port split? I found the easiest way is to run strace devlink split port svp0 count for, for example, and look through the uh, messages that is sent via netlink uh, to do the job. Because a lot of things is done under the hood of the devlink program itself. It's uh, really complicated. So we use that as a tool from our bash scripts. And that's a problem with the idempotency that I talk. Uh, it's hard to create the script that would be idempotent and will be clear to read at the same time. So right now, our script for the port split, for example, it's a systemd service. Uh, it's not idempotent. That's bad, because when we change the port split configuration of the switch, uh, it will fail. Uh, but it's not very bad, because usually we don't reconfigure the port split configuration of the switch. And it's, this script works well on a fresh booted switch. So that's the assumption of the script. The switch is freshly booted. So we could reboot the switch and it will work fine. Another subsystem that we use is a TC. It's even more powerful tool. It's 
used to configure the QOC, Q management, ACL, ACL counters. Uh, on ML Linux switches, you could uh, use that to configure very specific features like mirroring, sampling, and you even could change the VLAN, VLAN of the packet with a TC filter. But it's even harder to use from the code than a devlink because there is a more code on a TC tool. And there is another problem issue with the TC that it's very hard to understand. I mean, our no guys, they are very good in a theory of the network and they are very good in a practice of the network on the vendor boxes. But for example, if they need to configure pretty straightforward um, priority with uh, ECN, for example, they need to spend several hours reading the wiki page from Mellanox and to write the script, a bash script that will call TC to configure that. And for example, when another network guy will need to somehow improve that script, he will need to spend again several hours of reading documentation. So it it's very powerful. It's very powerful, but it differs from what people usually use with the vendor boxes. And from our experience of using the switch, that is really good. It's working nice in our network. It's working in our lab, but it's not very uh, easy to use uh, from the automation tools because there is no single point where you could go and get counters. You have ETH tool, you have TC, you have IP link, you have LLDP and another bunch of places where you need to get the counters or any auxiliary data. For example, if you want to get the MAC addresses of your ports or you want to get the speed of the transceiver that is installed in the port, you need to uh, run different tools. So it would be very great if uh, some kind of uh, daemon will appear that will collect all that information and uniform access to that information uh, via the GNMI protocol and even better if there will be a GNOI realization that will allow to uh, change VLAN on ports, for example, and do all that kind of stuff. It will simplify automation tools a lot and allow us to uh, act with white box, which is more like with uh, vendor boxes. Another good thing is to increase the number of configuration files because uh, right now to configure the network, uh, we need to configure the port split with a dev link interface. We need to configure bridge, VLAN and uh, IP addresses uh, with the ETC network interfaces with a if uh, up down two scripts and we need to configure QoS and that kind of stuff uh, with a TCU tool, with a, another script. Uh, it's a good idea, I think, to get that information in a, one big configuration file and uh, to have uh, this information in one file and work with it um, kind of atomically and to get all that things um, correlated to each other in a consistent state. And from my personal experience, uh, SwitchDev is working even better if uh, it's not in a production environment, but in a lab. It allows you to control the chip uh, very nicely. For example, you could just write entry to the FDB. Uh, you could... Uh, look through the different variables with a uh, dev link interface. You could do very fancy configuration with a TC. So it's very powerful for the lab. And I definitely could recommend you to play with that kind of switches uh, in your lab. 
thank you. And if you have any question, please feel free to ask it. Okay, uh, thanks, Anton. So did you say thousands of switches, right? You said thousands of switches? Uh, uh, actually, means... several hundreds of switches. Several hundreds, I'm sorry. I already, uh, I already claimed thousands to somebody. And the servers, hundreds of thousands or 100,000 servers? Uh, in general, we have like uh, 30 servers that connected to every switch. Okay. So All right. uh, several thousand, maybe ten thousand of servers that are connected to the switches. To the to the ones that are running switch dev. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. This this is a great success story in my opinion. But and uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna honor people who have posted on Q and A first, and uh, it happens to be Shujit. Okay, so I'm gonna post his question here. I you can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to continue from the last statement, for production, you ended up with building the end distro from scratch. So what feature capability did you get from this process that you didn't uh, have before? Uh, we actually use uh, Ubuntu as a base system. So it's not from scratch. I mean, it's not like using the build root or that kind of things. And um, it may be a difference uh, between the uh, Cumulus Linux, for example, but Cumulus Linux works with a switch uh, through the SwitchD. And when we are using a switch dev, we are using uh, a general Linux uh, network subsystem. And uh, a good example, uh, right after we make a record of uh, this presentation, uh, the next day, we tried to use uh, the 400G transceiver on our Mellanox switch. And I run ETH tool, and it said that, oh, it's only 100G on that port. And I think that might be a problem with the ETH tool. I go to the uh, source code of ETH tool, to, uh, to the repository of that, found that in the latest version, they do support uh, the QSFPDD transceivers and uh, 400G links. And I downloaded that on the switch directly uh, because it's uh, just a general Ubuntu system. I installed the GCC with the uh, app, app get GCC and I compiled the TH2 locally, run it and I get the 400G connectivity on that switch. Uh, that's Amazing from my point of view. So, so, so that's that's fair. I, I think uh, maybe I should. That's why I came on stage. I should expand my question. Right? So I understand Cumulus and and switch dev quite well. Uh, the 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 point I was making is that it is from a network perspective. Whether it was ZTP, whether it was better uh, only support, which by the way there are some comments only actually does support identification. We Cumulus had, and I think with uh, you guys had uh, ZTP implemented as well. The point, what, I, what I'm calling a distro is not necessarily the Ubuntu underneath or the app infrastructure, but the NOS infrastructure. And if you compare switch dev to switch D, which you did, which is the right comparison, the, the, it's a baby and bathwater conversation, right? So do you throw out everything else because you switch the data plane over, which is what switch dev was supposed to be, or do you basically say, because I've gone switch dev, I have to take up the whole stack? Because the things you built are done, you should probably try to commit them back into the projects that you put it into, right? Like any enhancements you've made into TC, any enhancements you've made into how ONI was set up, you guys should commit that back in. And at the end of the day, what you will get is an open source distro, right? It'll be another distro. And it needs to be packaged and shipped as such. Otherwise, the next person who tries to do what you've done will do exactly the same thing. There's no improvement for them. They would start where you started, they would end where you ended, and they would have to put in the same amount of effort. And the next question that I wanted to get some, so we talked, or you talked a lot about all the problems you had. What were the benefits? What, what did you get out of this? Why was this a good thing to do? Uh, you said the 400 gig transceiver, obviously, but that's not a production thing, right? You're not yeah. going to download a driver and push it into production the next day. 
Uh, okay, uh, I got a question. So uh, we actually not uh, uh, done the distro from the scratch because we used uh, tools and scripts uh, from the Mellanox. So I guess uh, that kind of uh, NOS uh, for normal usage uh, could be done uh, with a collaboration with a Mellanox because they are a good driver to do that. And we use, uh, uh, for example, the FRR that is used on a Cumulus 2. It's a general routing diamond that works fine on a Linux uh, and that kind of stuff. Uh, we have some uh, specific um, packets that we use only for our network. And um, for example, the configuration files for Telegraph or that kind of things, it should not be in general distribution, I think. Um, sure. And uh, of course, we save some money because when you are using Cumulus Linux, you need to pay for that. And there is an alternative. You could not pay for that when you are using a switch dev. So you could save uh, uh, pretty a lot of money if you are talking about the thousand of the switches. Right, right. So the economic impact is very clear, right? That, that part is, uh, and, and that maybe is the greatest answer. Okay. Yeah, and there is another thing. Uh, when you have some issues uh, with the switches, it's easier to debug if you have uh, control over the sources. If it's not located in a data plane, because when it's something in a data plane or uh, configured in the data plane, it's hard to debug. Uh, you need to go to the vendor. And the Mellanox is a very good vendor, I, could, I should say, because uh, we have a chat in a Telegram. We could go there and ask guys, and they support us, and it's uh, fantastic. Uh, they support us with the Cumulus too, of course. Uh, but when we have some issue on a control plane, you could go to your sources and found uh, where is a problem and to fix that and to deploy that to your production. And uh, you should not wait for a several months month when uh, it would be fixed uh, on a vendor site. And sometimes you don't need to upgrade a full distro and you need only to upgrade uh, one uh, Debian packet without maybe without the uh, uh, do not uh, disrupt the traffic flow makes sense makes sense i mean the last one is again common to many many linux uh, infrastructures but but uh, your point about being able to debug is is a big one right i mean that was one of the reasons why switch server started in the first place which is be able to go figure things out of course there is a flip side because there may be side effects that you don't think about if you just debug your your problem but uh, that's that's the end goal so so mobile so basically that the answer would be agility being able to address and debug issues quickly and, and economics right? those yeah those and, would be uh, the there is another one there is another one uh, the Mellanox do a lot of uh, low level utilities that works with a switch directly and mm. i'm not sure if they have a public presentation of that tools uh, but they have a, a sort of presentation about uh, what just happened about the switch for their customers. And there is a bunch of tools to uh, debug yeah. the, uh, even the uh, switch side of uh, that. So you could read something from the chip and uh, get that to the kernel and uh, debug some things uh, that is related to the data plane. So I'm good. What, what about no. testability? That the fact that let's say if you got this from Cumulus, they'll test for other corner cases that maybe you would you wouldn't have time to look into. Is that not a value? Uh, right now we didn't have any issues with that uh, after we deploy that in our production. It okay. works pretty well. Okay, and if it breaks, you're there to fix it. Okay, uh, next question. Okay, I know. A lot of people are typing in the chat, but if you type on QA, you get priority. Okay, so Donald goes next. Any routing suit? Any routing suit. Yeah, of course. Uh, as I said, we use a BGP. Uh, so our switch act as a router for all servers that is connected to that front ports. And uh, we use a BGP. We use uh, just a general FRR that works pretty well in our environment. Um, 
So we don't have any issues with that. So you use FRR? Yeah. Okay. And BGP only in FRR? Yeah. Okay. Uh, give me a thumbs up, Donald, if you, you're good with that. All right. Oh, man. All right. Thanks. <laughs> I hope that was Donald. <laughs> uh, next, uh, there's a few people on the chat here. So let me go backwards and I'll start. Uh, so here. Kurt Bruni, he, I believe Kurt is the only guy. I could be wrong. Do you want to come on stage? Or that that he is saying that only does support V6. I think in your presentation you said he didn't. Yeah, yeah, it does and it doesn't at the same time. When you look at the uh, repository of the ONI, uh, there is no IPv6 array support. So it's only DHCP v6. And I see. It actually works, but you could not provide, uh, for example, the URI of the uh, image to the array. Uh, and about the identification, it works really, but on the, on the second stage. So uh, you. First, you need to get the IP address from the DHCP. And if you're using DHCP before, the switch sends it a uh, model name. It sends it MAC address, but it doesn't send that serial number in that request. So there is no identification of the switch in DHCP request. And after that, when a switch will get the IP address, it uh, goes to the link that is provided in that DHCP request. And then it will provide a serial number, but only through the uh, HTTP header. So if you have like uh, 10 boxes that are connected uh, on uh, accessing the DHCP server, you don't know which of them is trying to get the IP address. So you, you need to give IP address for all of them. Mm -hmm. And after that, they, they will came uh, uh, we are the link that you provide them with the option, I think, two, three, nine, I guess. And uh, they will send the HTTP header with a serial number. And only at that point, you could choose if you have the image for that switch or not yet. Okay. Uh, Kurt, do you want to say anything or send me a thumbs up? Or I could put you on the stage if you want to build up on that. It sounds like there is support, but not sufficient. Yeah, and we are scary to update the only on the switches. <laughs> because upgrading the software is good because uh, you have only as a kind of a bootloader on the switches. And if you are uh, not good in the software part, I mean, the personal system part, it will uh, boot to the only. But if you will fail with the only, I will get some troubles and you need to go through the data center with a USB stick, I think, and boot yeah. from that stick and uh, recover your switches. I see. Okay. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't hear anything from Kurt, so I'm going to go to the next one again from Ido. He says, okay, there is a proposal to fix. It's not there, but there's a proposal to fix dev link to support system B. And Ido, if you want to come on stage, just raise your hand. Uh, do you, do you, can you see that, Anton? There is there is a proposal. To, okay. Yeah, yeah. I hope uh, it will be merged, and we could do that uh, through the system B. Right. It's the good news. Okay. And uh, Ido is on. I'm going to put Ido up on the stage. Yeah, I can, I can hear. We can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, so, like, I, I don't think it's a good idea to tie switch dev with a specific distribution. Uh, I don't have a lot of uh, faith in what is currently going on. And I think that generally we just need to improve general user space utilities 
such as system D, for example, to properly support DevLink or TC and to make configuration easier for everyone. And then it's not only some random distro that uh, gets the benefit of uh, this stuff, but everybody, uh, whether it is Fedora or Ubuntu or other stuff. Um, so I think we, we need to solve it more generically than just focusing on one distro, uh, especially if this distro is carrying a lot of uh, out of three patches for a specific vendor and stuff like that. That's not very healthy in my opinion. I agree. I agree with you. And uh, again, the Melanox is a great company. They are trying to get all their patches in the main line. So right now, I think we have like maybe five patches that uh, we need to apply to a 5.14 kernel. And uh, the number is decreasing. And they are not essential, actually. So usually we have patches that is patching something that we asked Melanox to do, and it's not in a mainline kernel yet, but will be there in just a few releases. Are you running your own kernel or you have just whatever the district is? Uh, we get the vanilla kernel and uh, put just a few patches to them. I mean, is it the distro kernel or kernel? No, no, no. It's a vanilla kernel from the main uh, repository. Okay, from kernel. Okay. Uh, actually, not a, not a current. Uh, it's not from a master branch. It's from a release branches. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's stable. Branch. Stable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other commentary, Ido? No, uh, thanks for sharing the experience. Uh, actually, I have a comment about the uh, DevLink support for systemd. Uh, mm -hmm. We use a uh, Mellanox cars for our uh, servers. And actually, right now, we have uh, several lines, uh, like a uh, 50G Ethernet in our servers. And it's pretty common, I would say, especially for a machine learning uh, cluster. So uh, splitting the ports uh, is it would be common for the servers, not only for the switches. So it would be nice to get that uh, for just the server distros. Yeah, so uh, I, I think we, we don't need to look at it as a server distro or switch distro, just server distro and that's it. Uh, because fundamentally there is nothing different between switches and server, it's just more ports. Okay, there is another question. So I'm going to give priority to people who post on QA. I know there's a lot of commentary going on. So Taras uh, has a question. I'm going to show it on the stage. If you want to stay, Ido, feel free to. Uh, have you tried out of switch dev uh, drivers except Melanox? Uh, we want to, but we, are, we don't have ability to do that because we need uh, a fast switches. We need uh, uh, 100G ports uh, to connect our servers. So the only big uh, big switch chip that supports switch dev is a Marvel. Marvel Falcon, as far as I know. But mm -hmm. we don't have boxes with that. Yeah, I think uh, here's a comment from uh, Rupa. She's saying Dent is trying to be the the distro of choice for switch dev. Um, um, yeah, we look through the dent, but it, from my point of view, it's more like uh, ONL. So it gives you the base layer uh, of uh, working with a box, of working with a fence, with the LEDs, and that kind of things. But we need uh, some special uh tools and uh, utilities to work with the uh, network part of that device as i said we need some kind of uh, gnmi diamond that doesn't care with a dent so that's the future of the linux of the switch okay i'm gonna bring in rupa as well yeah i was just gonna say that dent is not uh, fully a data center os today or a distro it's trying to be, but uh, it's true that it's only Amazon Go right now that is contributing and their vendors, right? But 
if somebody wants to take it the direction that they want to, I think they can. And I think it's not about, um, so contributions to user space, right? System D, everything should be done. I mean, an open distro needs to be built from an open source component. So the, I don't think that anybody's gonna take that away, all the development in the kernel and all that, but not everybody, at least in my experience, not everybody wants to maintain a kernel. Not everybody wants to maintain security patches for the kernel, right? And that's where putting it all together comes into play. And I think that's where a distro, open distro will help, like Sonic for switch dev. And uh, yeah, it, it'll just enable more pro proliferation, basically. Others, many others might adopt. That's given the experience that we have had. Yeah, and as other guys said, there is no like a switch dev distro right now. It's a technology that could be used, but there is no distro. There is no any specification for that uh, comparing to the Sonic that is specification. Mainly it's a specification and uh, after that it's a distro. And from our point of view, we want to use something that is uh, Ubuntu based just to be more uh, like our servers. So we have a future infrastructure to uh, support Ubuntu on our servers, and we need to reuse that to our switches. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think. You, sorry, you, comments, sorry I was just going to say that. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say that. I, I think you guys have the resources and to maintain a distro, right? I think you guys should stick with it. It gives you flexibility. You know how to build it, right? So I, I don't think Dent is for you too. I mean, I think you should continue with what works. Uh, for you. So I think you should have a choice of an open distro for people who don't want to, or for the people who are adopting Sonic, right? People are adopting Sonic because there is this build available out there that they can pick and try it out, right? For switch dev, yeah, you have to build. And there is, I mean, Mellanox has done a great job, actually, Edo, especially Edo and team, that they have wiki pages and they have documentation to get it to the next level. But uh, yeah, that comment was not for you, but it was for Dent is basically for somebody who does not want to build a distro right now, but if they want to try it out. But you're right that they, Dent is also not there yet because ONL, they have been trying to move to Yorkto, but ONL is something that was easy for them. I think they're out of time as well. Okay, I'm going to, uh, we're going to wrap it up after this commentary. We have a great closing session coming up. So, um, Anton, do you see the do you see the message on the screen? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I and co make sure that projects like only the link to see wrappers change changes are pushed into the tools that manage them? Uh, actually, we do not do any changes in uh, that uh, part of the software. Uh, the wrappers of the devlink, the system D support uh, over the devlink is a good solution to do that even better than our tools that we use. It's really a simple bash script. Uh, that we do not have yet a wrapper over the TC, but that uh, that's a good uh, point to grow uh, to make a library that works well with, with the TC primitives. And it's a way to integrate that into a daemon like a GenMI. Uh, we are not doing that yet, but we want to, and we will happy to share that, uh, to open source that, because actually Yandex is open sourcing its tools. Uh, it's pretty common for us, and uh, we will try to do that. Excellent. Uh, let, uh, we're running out of time here, I'm sorry, but- uh, yeah. John, may I have uh, just uh, one uh, sentence? Okay, uh, please. There is a previous uh, paper with a uh, net plan, right? It's the correct name. Net net net, net plan, you said. Oh, no, net no. pen. Net pen. That was the previous. Yeah. Yes. So uh, uh, there was a few questions about how to integrate integrate net pen with a uh, uh, real hardware. So the switch dev is uh, definitely the solution for that. Really, I could recommend for everybody if you want to play with the hardware. Uh, with a hardware lab, and uh, you want to integrate that with uh, any uh, test plans, you should use the switch dev. 
that's a really a very good solution. Mm -hmm. So the net pen that will generate uh, with without the net namespaces, unfortunately, but it would work. Um, you deploy that to the switch dev and it will configure ports in uh, that manner that you, that you need to. So that's the answer to that question. Use a switch dev. Yeah, we thank you for your contribution, Anton, and we're going to wrap it up here. Let's, let's thank uh, Anton.